what you have to say about this reading. As I said, it's a little more abstract. It deals with a lot of big issues about capitalism, but it attempts, or at least it implies, it points towards Paris and New York and London and Dhaka and Mumbai and cities around the world and informal settlements. It's very much um, resonates with uh, the work we're trying to do, but it falls short. <clears throat> and I apologize, we couldn't find a better reading than this, but it falls short in that it, it points at uh, architectural phenomena and architectural design as part of this larger, global, increasingly globalized system without really digging into the specifics of what architecture does, how architecture does it, how the form of cities operates as an instrument for capital accumulation, uh, wealth accumulation, and the reproduction of the systems that support that. And so, you know, Robert, it's very up to date in, in relation with the political issues that has been happening in the cities recently. Yeah. So it's very up to date with the with the fact that uh, the, 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 this fact of the right of the people, the right to the city, it, it is uh, is a is a statement that um, represents something very important, I think. So, and uh, for those of you who attended the project to practice lecture this week, uh, Wednesday, uh, you heard in those uh, young practitioners a direct reference to the issues in this reading about property, uh, property ownership, uh, and the institutions surrounding private property as one of the biggest challenges of architectural practice in the world today. Um, it was so wonderful to get a sense that architects, young architects, are actually uh, having the courage to face these issues that um, would appear to conveniently lie beyond the boundaries of our profession. And they instead have identified it as a fundamental core condition that until we address uh, these issues around private property and wealth accumulation, um, we can't really uh, live up to our ethical obligations as architects. Uh, ab lo. It's, um, their lecture uh, should be available somewhere online if you missed it, um, but it really is a fascinating presentation. I'm so grateful uh, to the excellent people, Penn and Antonio, for um, getting uh, such excellent speakers, especially these young leaders who are really uh, opening our eyes to things that we never imagined we'd be hearing out of the mouths of architects. So um, this is all to stimulate your thinking about this reading in particular. And um, the questions that will face all of you during your career, uh, your career space, uh, the coming decades are, uh, we anticipate that the coming decades will be filled with opportunities to either deepen the problems by continuing business as usual, or critically identifying what architecture can do to shift this puzzle. So uh, I have opened the chat. I'm really interested in uh, the takeaways that you guys have to offer uh, on this uh, pretty challenging reading. Uh, but the thing, the reason I've, we've never assigned this reading before, but we had the courage to assign it in a way because um, you guys have such a, a, a more solid foundation than previous groups of students because these issues of extractive capitalism were first introduced in your history theory courses. And we have all of that to build on. And you will see in this lecture that we uh, really take a lot of advantage of the fact that uh, you've already seen a lot of this material that we're going to present today and that it's uh, really a review 
but looking at similar material with armed with a, an even more sharper lens, a sharper set of tools to identify a built form, the formal spatial institutional arrangements, the relationships between buildings, spaces, and the institutions that are housed within them and the institutional arrangements that produce these buildings and spaces. Uh, and that's exactly what you are looking at when you choose your images from the slightly elevated aerial perspective. Uh, you're looking at the formal spatial institutional arrangements, uh, uh, which is something that the students that came before taught us. Uh, we didn't always teach it this way, but we learned from the work of the students that this is what we're doing. Uh, so uh, thank you for these excellent takeaways. Um, keep them coming. And even more significant than the takeaways, just a reminder, uh, there's a growing sense of urgency. There should be a sense of, uh, you should feel a bit agitated about the prospects for your careers. You should be a bit uh, disquieted by the problems that you are inheriting. And you should really, you should leverage that anxiety. Uh, hopefully, um, you know, friends don't let friends get too anxious because there is hope. To the extent that architecture is implicated and involved in the reproduction of these systems, it's uh, after we get over the, the, um, the humiliation of the fact that we let this happen, uh, then there should be a source of hope that we don't have to change other people, we can change ourselves, we can practice better. Uh, and so that uh, should be a source of great hope and that by working with your colleagues and helping bring them along and listening to them as they help bring you along, that we can build a collective ethos in the profession of more and better architecture moving forward that does a better job than it has in the past, not just in slightly improving things, but of identifying systemic mechanisms working through the built environment, identify them and dismantle them and replace them with mechanisms that are designed to do better. It is a design problem. So I'm going to, Manuel, do you have anything to add to that? Preamble? No, that's a, that's a good preamble. I, 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 I agree with you in the point about the reading and the situation and the, the future that they they have to face in the next few decades. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen. One thing I want to uh, make clear right from the start is that when we use the word capital, we're talking about money and wealth. We're not talking about capital cities. It might be tempting to think, oh, capital, uh, Washington, D.C., um, Moscow, Russia. No, that's not the capital we're talking about. Although sometimes there are uh, accumulations of capital wealth in capital's seats of, of government. Um, but that is, just to be clear, that is not what we're talking about. Um, so before we jump into the content, let's take a care of a little bit of uh, business for the class. Uh, we are finalizing the term project assignment. Uh, and in the coming days, uh, we will, you will see it appear on Brightspace. And there are, are really um, four components to the term project. The first one is due on Monday, April 5th, and you probably uh, don't care about anything that that's, that's that far away, but I just, we just want to give you a heads up that this is um, an exception to the pattern of the course where you have uh, reading to do for Friday uh, and you need to prepare your 
your takeaway and your target questions for the chat at the Friday lecture by 10 a.m. And you also, every week, you have an analysis, analysis assignment due on Wednesday. Uh, we are maintaining those two rhythms that uh, when we reach, when we get to, to the end of our weekly numbers down to one and we look at the city as a cosmological model, uh, going back deep into the history of cities, uh, that uh, beyond that lies the terrain of the term project. And you will once again, with the same rhythm, after you, uh, after we have our Wednesday forum uh, on April 7th, you will have a reading to do. And that reading, uh, you're expected to have done that reading by 10 a.m. Friday, the 9th of April, uh, when you we get together and talk about what images uh, might work in your groups and form your groups. Um, so that rhythm continues. The, the special thing uh, that we ask of you in the term project is we ask you to identify a topic that you are interested in uh, based on the content of the course. What issues of the course do you uh, have you dropped a flag on and said, oh, this sounds interesting. I need to circle back and dig deeper because I am a res I'm going to take care of my education beyond what the schooling uh, requires of me. I'm going to use the schooling to extend my education and take care of my responsibility to myself and my colleagues in the world by digging deeper into this topic. So what topic are you interested in digging deeper on? What three readings uh, might be useful in helping you dig more deeply? Keep in mind that we don't want an ARC Daily article about Aravena's Half House. Uh, we want something substantive, something uh, roughly equivalent to what the readings you've been getting uh, each week. So it should be between 15 and 30 pages long. It should be a dependable scholarly uh, piece of writing. It can be a book chapter. It can be the introduction to uh, a book that you've identified uh, being of interest. Um, and we welcome uh, a discussion in private uh, if you are if you want guidance on what books you might consider, what pieces of uh, writing you might consider uh, for choosing as your term project reading, uh, please, um, we'll have hours after class and maybe we'll schedule some office hours outside of cl the class schedule when uh, you can do that. Um, do you have any questions right now about any of that? You could put it in the chat if I can find it. Um, if there are none, uh, then maybe we'll continue on. Is there a chat? The chat is open, Roger? Robert? Yes. Um, oh, yes, I see it. I see it. OK. OK. It's the chat open. is always open okay. here in Zoom Town. So here's the outline of our lecture. Um, we start with the right to the city. Um, and we take another lap through a lot of the history that we've already seen in the history theory course last summer. Uh, but this time we do it, as I said, with a sharper set of tools for focusing in exactly on uh, how uh, architectural and urban form the formal spatial institutional arrangements of our cities uh, operate in the context of capitalism, not simply as the passive reflection of capitalism, but at its core as, as the infrastructure, as the instrumentation that produces the outcomes of extractive capitalism. Uh, and thus the cycle of oppression can be broken by more critical, more insightful, and better architecture. 
And so a lot of these things, uh, the seeds planted by the reading about what does the right to the city look like uh, in architectural form? Uh, these, all these rights and laws and human rights and civil rights, it's all so abstract. What does it look like? Show me an elevation, show me a ground plan of human rights in action in the formal spatial arrangements of cities. Um, well, first of all, what are we looking for and how, how is it that generation after generation have missed the clues? Uh, Here's a hint. Uh, this is uh, Eichmann on trial in the 60s uh, for war crimes committed during the Holocaust in World War II. And Hannah Arendt is um, the brilliant woman who wrote about uh, these topics and um, has recently sold a lot more books than uh, anyone expected her to sell in part because of the uh, recent um, political emergences around the world, uh, including in the United States, that the question of how does evil propagate? How does oppression reproduce itself? And she coined this term, the banality of evil. What does that mean? Uh, doing a deep dive on how Germany uh, was pulled into this totalitarian system of Nazism. How did that occur? Germans are not known as being pushovers. Germans are not stupid. Uh, they're like the rest of us. They are, you know, they are, they are critical thinkers. So how did this happen? And in Eichmann's trial, he repeated over and over again, and the lawyers went to great pains to point out what a good person Eichmann is. He's a family man. He's a father. He's a good husband. He's a good colleague and goes to church in the best of intentions for uh, himself and his country. He was doing his patriotic duty. He was following the commands of his superiors and he was doing what he was told to do. He was a good German and you've probably heard that term before. And so Hannah Arendt, um, points out, the takeaway from this, uh, according to Hannah Arendt, she identifies the problem is not, it's not like in the James Bond movies where there's an evil genius and he was mistreated as a child and he wants very overtly to perpetrate criminal offenses against humanity. If only it were that simple. It's not that simple. Uh, it's really a lot of what goes wrong in the world in, um, and sometimes very, very wrong are otherwise good people having a bad day. Otherwise good people who think they are doing the right thing according to the way the society structures itself. I want to pay off my student loans. I want to live in a good house. Um, so I'm going to do what I'm told and keep my job and pay my mortgage, etc. I'm just being a good architect. This is a recipe for, this is a, opening the door to the banality of evil. Uh, and it's, evil is not a dramatic thing where you, you need to have a gun in your hand to perpetrate evil. Far from it. Evil gets reproduced and perpetrated by simply following instructions without thinking sufficiently critically about what's happening. And uh, one of the cures for the banality of evil, one of the remedies is uh, something that's emerged uh, in design, in architecture, and has swept through business schools. And you've seen this slide before at the end of last summer, where I told you about the Stanford Business School has rebranded itself as the design school because according to the faculty and administrators and students of one of the world's greatest business schools, uh, design thinking is the most effective way to manage complexity and to avoid the traps of overly narrow thinking, of thinking more broadly, 
of taking advantage of individual silos, but bringing them into a studio setting of the business school or the design school or the architecture school by bringing those individual uh, silos of expertise in a holistic manner together into a studio setting, you can manage complexity through the mechanisms of design thinking. And you've seen this slide before, hopefully you remember it, uh, that step one in design thinking is empathy. See the dog collar? So empathize is the first step. And this is not easy. This is not easy for anyone. It's especially not easy for anyone who's had uh, an architectural education because the culture of architectural education is uh, one of uh, great ego and uh, sense of privilege and authority. And uh, we're doing great things to, uh, to work uh, to correct those forces. But uh, step one is to acknowledge that those forces are still at work especially if you're a male, especially if you're white, especially if you are privileged enough to attend an excellent design school, empathizing uh, step one can be one of the hardest things to do and one of the most serious barriers to doing, uh, performing our ethical responsibilities in the world. And so we, we talk about, uh, so let's talk about capitalism. This is tricky and we need to talk about this first because the larger world is very sloppy about this term. And I want you to notice uh, the small c on the word capitalism. You will look in the popular press uh, uh, all kinds of critical writing about capitalism. Capitalism is bad. Capitalism is great. Pa capitalism causes damage. Capitalism lifts people out of poverty. There are a lot of contradictory claims about capitalism. And so, uh, and it's very confusing. Who's right? Well, before you even ask that question, it's important to understand that when you hear the word capitalism, what people are talking about um, most, most of the time is the specific flavor of capitalism that we have inherited in this world today. And this specific regime of capitalism is a very, very local, small subset of the larger category, the larger topic of capitalism. And um, so we're going to talk very briefly here about the larger category of capitalism. Uh, and some of you have taken economics. Uh, hopefully um, this is a review for those of you and maybe you can help the rest of us with some of this topic. But at its, at its most fundamental level, the system of capitalism uh, is defined as the operation of free market forces in the organization and the management of four elements uh, in the production of goods and services. In parentheses, I always have to add, and bads and disservices. Capitalism has a weak point where it doesn't, the, the capitalism that we have inherited does a very poor job of distinguishing between goods and services and bads and disservices. They all show up together on the same spreadsheet as money being exchanged. So a dollar changing hands uh, a million times or a million dollars being uh, changing hands once that shows up as a million dollars on the spreadsheet. Also, a million dollars to, uh, to destroy things shows up the same way that a million dollars to build things. So that million, it's the same million dollars on the spreadsheet of our current uh, mode of capitalism with no distinction between goods and bads, 
services and disservices. But at its core, it's the exchange of currency, of money, of value, the exchange of value in the mobilization of land, labor, capital, and profits. The thing we're most interested in are the first two, land and labor, because that's where housing happens. And so most of this lecture has to do with the space that humans occupy, the space that is allocated for human occupation and the quality of those spaces and the formal spatial institutional arrangements of housing uh, in relationship to urban amenities, uh, to services, to education, to healthcare, et cetera. The land and the labor are the things we care about most. Um, now let's, so there are lots and lots of books out there and there are lots and lots of podcasts and videos and statements about how horrible capitalism is and how wonderful capitalism is. Um, I encourage you to uh, understand uh, or, or ask the question, when people are talking about just how horrible capitalism is, what are they really talking about? Are they talking about capitalism with a small c, the big thing? Or are they talking about monopoly capitalism, which is a very specific um, form of capitalism where large business interests really uh, have successfully dismantled the, the checks and balances that normally come with market forces. Are they talking about extractive capitalism where uh, the, the sucking out of resources or the dumping of waste is not priced. It's deliberately avoided. It's deliberately called externalities. So we don't put a price on extraction of rare or, or we underprice the extraction of rare uh, resources and we put zero cost in most cases on dumping into the environment. And so that's a very specific regime within the larger category of capitalism. So uh, I fundamentally uh, embrace Naomi Klein's critique, and I think she's gotten it horribly, tragically wrong at the same time. And um, I think Robert Reich, uh, you know, we can talk about these things. Um, more hopeful are writers like Henderson and Reich, who are talking about, who make the acknowledgement that there's small c capitalism, which is the larger set of abstractions and principles, in which there's a great deal of hope to be found if we can design these systems to operate in a more with more favorable outcomes. And then there's the critical voices which look very narrowly at the current state of capitalism and its consequences, which are quite dark. So here's the movie um, that Naomi Klein uh, has developed based on the book. We like to do videos. The majority of the human race does not see global warming as a serious threat. Celebrate! Climate legislation is dead. We, in the global north, with less than 20% of the population, are responsible for over 70% of global emissions. We are drilling all over the place. On the other side of the world, those people who are the most affected by climate change, most affected by environmental injustice, have the least responsibility for creating this crisis in the first place. The amount of fossil fuel that we're combusting year on year is growing. We're going in completely the wrong direction. I've spent six years wandering through the wreckage caused by the carbon in the air and the economic system that put it there. That old paradigm will be forced to change, either by the environment around us or by us. Fire up this movement! I'm a dead man. 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 I'm a
by C communities who are thrown into the front line. You see the incredible transformation. They become stronger, they stand up. So here's the big question. What if global warming isn't only a crisis? What if it's the best chance we're ever gonna get to build a better world? Change or be changed? There are limits. Let's celebrate the limits because we could reinvent a different future. Okay. So this, this brings us back into the familiar territory of the challenge of architecture, the challenge of this career that we have chosen, the challenge uh, that is presented by the realization that uh, architecture does not lie outside of the system. It is the system made manifest in physical built form. And as such, it is part of uh, the solution. It's not just part of the problem, it is part of the solution that the projects that we celebrate in the lecture series that our excellent colleagues are presenting to us every semester, the studio projects that you engage in uh, semester after semester in studio, uh, these are all uh, speculations on what then must we do based on our critical evaluation of human history and the role of architecture in it, what are we going to do about it? What is the role? What can an architectural design do to open up the possibility of other realities moving forward? How can it open up options for systemic change? And through systemic change, cultural change. If you are uh, if you are interested in taking it from the other side of this uh, reciprocal relationship, there are no arrows on these lines. You can start from the cultural part. You can take advantage of the fact of your remarkable skill with the electric guitar, and you can become a rock and roll uh, uh, legend. And you can change it from the cultural side. You can make movies. You can write books, you can write fiction. And there uh, is a huge cultural movement that's operating from the other side as well. Or you can run for mayor and you can uh, become the chief economist of some future presidential uh, administration. And you can work it from the middle out in both directions. You can enter this uh, chain at any point. We're architects, we enter from the project side. We look at history as uh, a demonstration of the design of physical systems, how it can impact social systems, uh, administrative systems, and eventually uh, uh, have an impact on cultures. We've seen this before. We use this as an example of what can go wrong if our critical evaluation of architecture is insufficient, if it's an incomplete architectural criticism, we run the risk of merely doing slightly better architecture in the service of inherently evil systems. This is a recipe for reproducing the banality of evil. So this gives us an urgency into our re-examination of history. So the further we go back, the less obvious it is that our study of the history of cities has any relationship on uh, the present. Um, yesterday, I presented your work uh, to uh, the Colleges of the Fenway Teaching and Learning uh, Conference. Uh, and uh, so Manuel and I were there we showed uh, the people in, in the audience your work uh, and as a demonstration of how history doesn't have to be this passive study. It can be a, a method of critical examination that 
provides uh, the, the instructions for how we then go out into the world and design better. So history is not a passive study. It is something that you do, that professionals perform in their practice, in the uh, routine day-to-day -day operations of a practice. So um, I'm going to pick up the pace significantly because you've seen this. You've seen the extract of capitalism that is at the core of uh, the, his, the architectural history that we started with last May. Uh, and so we saw this. We saw this is the year uh, uh, from 1450 onward. There was a sudden, uh, this sudden uh, bizarre, unprecedented reaching out from these tiny countries in uh, Western Europe. First, the Portuguese shot off around the Cape of Good Hope in Africa into the Indian Ocean and across to India and elsewhere, uh, all the way to Japan. And shortly thereafter, the Spaniards uh, reached out um, across the Atlantic, reaching uh, the New World. So we saw this. Here's the Portuguese, uh, the sudden explosion of Portuguese navigation um, and the necessity of the Pope negotiating the uh, division of the world, the, the entire globe was divided in half. Uh, first, uh, uh, across the Atlantic, and that's, it was divided between the two Catholic uh, kingdoms of Portugal, uh, got one half of the world, and Spain got the other half of the world. Why did the Pope have to divide the world in half? Well, Portugal and Spain were reaching out and they were doing two things. They were converting heathens to Christianity or killing them. The other thing they were doing is they were extracting gold and silver. And so this, and spices. And spices are actually more valuable than gold or silver at this time. It weighs less. You can fill a ship with gold uh, to a certain point, uh, but if you fill the ship uh, to the gunnels uh, in spices, it's actually worth more than gold or silver. So, um, so the, the two Catholic empires reached out across the planet. So from around uh, 1450 to around uh, 1600, S Spain and Portugal dominated global extractive capitalism. And you see the Portuguese in blue, the Spanish in red. Uh, that's why um, part of us uh, in, in Latin America, some of us speak Portuguese over there in Brazil, and some of us speak Spanish, the rest. So the Spanish found the biggest city anyone had ever seen, Mexico a place we now call Mexico City. It was called Tenochtitlan. Uh, and it was a gridded city. And we're going to talk a lot about what happens next uh, in the Spanish idea of cities. Uh, we're going to talk about that a lot next week uh, when we look at grids as we go back in time. But suffice it to say that the Aztec gridded city was altered to become the Spanish gridded city and uh, the necessity of uh, erasing uh, the Aztec symbols, the Aztec religion, and displacing it entirely and overriding uh, the Catholic religion onto the city, a European image of the city, was done by dismantling the buildings and reassembling those materials on the same site on top of the sacred places of, at the center of Mexico City uh, to produce a Catholic urban form. And we looked at this um, a bit last summer, um, quickly moving forward. Throughout the Spanish colonies, we see these strategies. Uh, and we also see wealth extraction uh, from the Americas into Europe 
that transforms the cities of Europe. So this is a theme <clears throat> that we see throughout uh, the course or our study of history and theory that where we used to study the architecture of Seville, we now realize that we can't study the architecture of Seville or Barcelona or Madrid without studying the architecture of Mexico, of uh, Cusco. And I'm using Mexico City, I'm saying Mexico because that was the name of the, the Spanish city. Uh, but these, the new cities of the new world were extracting uh, commodities uh, of great value, gold and silver, especially silver, um, and bringing it to Europe and building the cities of Europe based on the wealth. So we no longer just look at Venice, just look at Florence, just look at Rome. We also look at the larger networks of extraction uh, that are, are part of the system that built those cities. So we don't look at these things in isolation. Uh, we will look next week, uh, you'll see this slide again, of the laws of the Indies where the architectural form of these towns was very deliberately and explicitly an instrument of reproducing this extractive system and the control of labor. So again, it's the uh, domination of landscapes by producing a grid so that the, the land itself can be controlled and as property, as private property. And then through housing and social ordering uh, uh, systems that we're going to see examples of again uh, to control the labor. So land and labor is where the architects are coming into play in the operation of extractive colonial systems. We'll look at this next week. And so uh, the, the Catholic Church frowned upon uh, murder and enslavement of Christians. The Pope did not like that. So as soon as the indigenous peoples of the Americas converted to Christianity, uh, it, was, it was not acceptable to enslave or murder them. Uh, and so instead of slavery, the Spanish invented the encomienda system. It was a system of obligations that uh, resurfaced at the end of slavery in the United States in uh, it, it's a type of sharecropping strategy. And they're just like in slavery, just like in sharecropping, the encomienda system operated through architectural and urban form uh, that worked to control the population, to control the land and the labor. Again, land and labor. Uh, and here you see this dramatic example of the prior constructions of the Aztecs were so monumental, so impressive, that sometimes uh, dismantling them was just too much work. And so the Spanish buried them and built uh, a relatively uh, timid construction on the top of the resulting mountain. Here you see the famous mountain of silver in Potosi, Bolivia, uh, that uh, it was the source of so much silver that it triggered runaway inflation first in Europe, throughout Europe, then in China and Japan. So this is an early example of global economic systems that sweeps across the planet. Globalization is not something that started when your parents were in high school. It's, it, it is something that has occurred uh, episodically over the course of history. Notice in the foreground, what do we have? We have exactly what we look for in our analysis work, where we see architectural scale, human experience uh, in the context and in relationship to the larger landscape and urban ordering system, the patterns. <coughs> and there it is uh, today. We still have the evidence of these ordering systems in, implanted on the planet's surface today. The encomienda system was unspeakably cruel 
and it operated in part through the careful administration of skin tones as produced in this catalog of hierarchy and status where the painter's brush is very deliberately capturing lighter shades and darker shades as a way of producing this guide, this catalog. This is not just art for the sake of art. This is a guidebook. This is a yearbook. Think of high school, where instead of it being subtle, like who's on the football team and who's in the cheerleading squad and who's in the, the chess club, this is a much more explicit ordering system where the whiter the blood and the lighter your skin tone, the higher you are uh, able to rise. And there was uh, a, a market in uh, falsifying uh, ancestry records and the skin tones. Uh, the painter could make a, a very handsome living by accepting bribes to tone it down or tone it up a little bit in the choice of pigment in these colors. Um, so now we move on. So, so for 150 years, the Portuguese and the Spanish system of just raw extraction dominated this, this global system. And so the architecture was more blatantly brutal. Uh, the, yes, there were churches, there was a concern for souls, but there was the encomienda system and its architecture. Uh, and uh, the next wave uh, came when the Dutch and the English invented, and I mean that, uh, that word is chosen uh, very carefully, they invented international corporate capitalism. Uh, they invented the corporation um, by uh, creating uh, a, a joint stock company. The first one was in England, but the next year uh, in Amsterdam, the Dutch uh, uh, East India Company uh, took off because you could trade its shares in, in the stock market. And so from this humble fishing village, uh, where it turned out it had a very uh, convenient location for trading fish in this market that we looked at last summer. The architecture of this market is operating as an instrument of trust. The marketplace is open. This uh, also very carefully chosen words. This open market is the birthplace of the idea of the open market. It is not simply an analogy. It was a literal uh, operation, architectural operation uh, back in the 17th century where corn was brought and sold at one column and then wood would be uh, brought, a sample of wood would be brought and sold at another column or a space between columns or a corner. So each architectural element in the market became a location for buying and selling. And because there were so many buyers uh, and sellers gathered together around that one column, uh, bidding up or down the price of corn, uh, this turned out to be a very dependable uh, location for determining whether the demand was going up the demand was going down, the supply was going up, or the supply was going down. And so the price sheets produced out of a day of trading uh, in the open market of Amsterdam turned out to be a dependable enough registration of uh, the relationship between supply and demand that those price sheets were uh, printed up and sent around the different ports of Europe and down into the Mediterranean to establish the price of corn and establish the price of lumber and everything else. Now here's why this worked as uh, another reason this worked as an instrument of trust is when, I, when I'm selling you corn, I might have a basket of corn there at the column. So take a look at how good the corn is. And if the buyer said, 
well, I see that the corn in this basket is excellent corn. I really admire the quality of your corn, but how do I know the corn I'm going to uh, receive delivery of? You're not going to give me this basket. How do I know the quality of the corn that I'm uh, buying is similar quality? And the corn seller can say, well, if you'll just step over here to the canal uh, next to the dam that put the dam in Amsterdam, uh, I will show you my boat filled with corn and you can check for yourself. And maybe the buyer says, sure, I, I would like to do that. But very quickly, trust is established and the offer of the possibility of inspecting the corn, the lumber, the wheat, the fish right there in, in the boat uh, makes the actual inspection of those goods unnecessary. And that level of trust, where the verification is available right there, uh, if you want it, means that the verification is less necessary. And so the architectural, the formal spatial institutional arrangements of the fish market in Amsterdam produces a regime of trust that is the basis for everything that then follows. As soon as you can establish a regime of trust, you can use paper instead of corn. And you can say, uh, you can purchase the corn in Amsterdam, but you receive delivery of it in Antwerp or in London or in Lisbon, Portugal, or elsewhere, or in Cape Town, South Africa. So the establishment of trust through the architecture of the market is the basis for paper exchange. And uh, I don't know if your parents told you about this stuff we used to carry in these things called wallets, but we, I don't have one anywhere near here. But if you ask, your parents might still be doing this, ask to see what they have in there. There are these green strips of paper uh, and it says, in God we trust. Well, this history reveals God has nothing to do with it. It's really in the formal spatial institutional arrangements of the market we trust. And so the market architecture grows and develops. There are warehouses below the new market in Amsterdam where uh, the goods and commodities can be stored for easy inspection. Uh, the Weyhouse, uh, where the it's really the Bureau of Weights and Measures of Delfach, that's how you say that. The Weyhouse is right next to the market off to one side. And here's the formal spatial arrangement. There you see the fish market in pink in the foreground. Here you see the Amsterdam Exchange where stocks and bonds and uh, other paper items are exchanged and that's where that's the architecture we looked at with the warehouses below and just adjacent is the w Bureau of Weights and Measures to make sure that the scale that's measuring the corn is well calibrated. The fact that the official in charge of managing the weights and measures is a short walk away meant that there could be trust that the weights and measures are being checked on a daily basis. So the formal spatial arrangement of this urban core of Amsterdam is very much a part of the operation of capitalism because the architecture and the urban form are mechanisms, are instruments of trust construction. And then the merchant bank, if I bring my piece of paper from the, the Amsterdam Exchange Building, I can walk across the Dam to uh, the Stadthaus, the town hall, where the Merchants Bank is located on the right side here on the, on the front of this uh, axon. And I can exchange my paper for uh, gold or silver or more paper that also uh, can be exchanged elsewhere. And the, de the establishment of decorum, no spitting, no cursing, no violence, uh, politeness ensues. And this is the basis of the market system of trust.
And then the larger urban form uh, is very much a part of the operation of this commodity speculation that if I am a well-to-do uh, Hollander, uh, a Dutch person, I live in one of these houses in Amsterdam. And uh, this is not just a house, thank God for uh, that they didn't have single use zoning, but in the bottom floor, I had a shop or a factory where I could process goods. On the uh, upper floor, just up from the canal and street level, I had my house, a series of rooms in split section where my family would dine and entertain and live. And then in the, the upper part of the house, uh, the upper levels of the house, two or three levels at the top of the house, it's basically a warehouse. So I purchase or I, I am paid in lumber or pepper or, f or not fish but in commodities that can be stored. And then I watch the market. Uh, I try to buy low and sell high. And if the price of lumber uh, goes up, then I might choose to quickly open the doors on the upper levels, use this hoist, um, the ridge beam of the, of the shop house uh, is a hoist way. I can lower it down to the canal and get my lumber to the, the dom and exchange it uh, while the price is still high before other people do it. And so the city of Amsterdam grew in these concentric pattern of canals uh, to accommodate all of these houses. Uh, and the property here uh, became storehouses for commodities. And so every house was also a warehouse. Every resident of the city is also a speculator. And so this was the emergence of speculative capitalism. And the city had to get bigger as speculation became more and more popular and more and more goods were being traded through uh, the marketplace of Amsterdam. So on the left, you see the Dutch shop house. On the right, you see the Southeast Asian shop house um, uh, based on the Chinese vernacular architecture with all of the same functions, a shop, a home, uh, a factory in the back, and storing storage of goods uh, in the upper levels. And these shop houses became the basis of the cities of Southeast Asia, which is responsible for the value extraction that fueled the construction of Amsterdam and what we study in the history of architecture and the history of art as the golden age of Dutch um, civilization. Here we remembered uh, Batavia, now it's called Jakarta. Um, above uh, this, the, the Grand Canal through the center is the European white town uh, and below the central canal are the, uh, the, the barracks, uh, to, to use a polite term, but basically it's, it's, a, it's a prison system of labor. And uh, uh, north of the canal, we have the names and addresses of every European or Chinese, uh, the merchant class of the Chinese who really administered the city. Um, they lived in this prestigious part of town and their names and addresses are listed. And then in the southern part of town, uh, we just have race and ethnicity of groups that were kept small enough so that they could not speak the same language, band together and foment a revolt uh, to overcome uh, the overseers of the town. So the city itself is a labor camp with administrators protected in the north from the uh, threat of social unrest of the population in the south. Well, north and south, uh, I'm not telling you which way east and north is. And uh, in a way that resonates with everything we've studied uh, in more recent history, um, people of certain class, just like in the Spanish paintings of skin tone, the way uh, hierarchies were controlled uh, in this system of Southeast Asia uh, speculation, uh, some people could wear uh, certain clothing, uh, these 
these codes that regulated what people could wear uh, was a way of controlling the population. Uh, if you were wearing these clothes, you were allowed to uh, walk through these streets. If you're wearing different clothes, then there are gateways that prevent you from crossing the canal and into different parts of the city. And depending on your, your status, you, were, you could either have six horses on your carriage, two horses on your carriage, no carriage, but you could be carried or you could have an umbrella over your head. All of these were signals of status. And uh, at these control points of the bridge crossings, one guard or two guards could control the movement of the population according to the uh, status designated by their clothing, their skin color, their language, what language do they speak. You could tell who was who very deliberately. It was illegal to disguise yourself as someone else. And that system continued into the 19th century. Um, we saw it in South Africa. And at a, at a moment when uh, of great panic, the European overseers decided to uh, lock the gates of the Chinese labor quarter and uh, kill everyone in it. Um, and so we see these two systems a very similar canal city formation based on the idealized model in the lower right, one operating uh, and growing uh, exponentially in Northern Europe and the other at the exact same time being designed by the same architects and engineers and the, being painted by the same painters, uh, the city of Batavia. These are two sides of a single system. It's like the north side of the tracks, the south side of the tracks, um, one is where labor and capital produce value. The other is where that capital accumulates, to use the terminology that we saw in the reading. And the same painters are painting uh, the core, the marketplace of Batavia on the left, Amsterdam on the right, showing the characters in their costumes to the point where we can actually identify every group that is being depicted in the foreground of these representations of the city. And once again, it is worth noting that uh, the choice of viewing angle, do you see that? In the foreground, architectural scale human experience in relationship to the larger arrangement and system of the urban form. And so you see culture system project uh, and human experience within uh, that project, all, all in one single perspective view. So the Dutch dominated uh, quite a while through their company capitalism. The Dutch and the English had their company capitalism of commodity speculation. The next wave is when the companies ran into trouble. They're, they had trouble maintaining their monopoly hold. And so the state took over. And so the Dutch government took over from the Dutch company. The English government took over from the English company around uh, 1800. And from that point forward, uh, we see this dramatic shift. The British very much outpaced uh, the Dutch and the Spanish and the French and the Portuguese. Uh, and so they became the dominant force. And so the city of London grows exponentially as a place of accumulation of the capital that is being extracted through these uh, now government-led uh, extractive operations uh, in the colonies, the ever-expanding colonial empire of the, of the British. And the Great Fire of London uh, and the opportunity to reconstruct um, the great lessons of the rebuilding of London after the fire is that uh, as attractive and uh, appealing as our abstract diagrams are, the infrastructures embedded in the ground after disaster um, make it very difficult to change the street pattern uh, of London after the fire. Here you see all the axial views that are driving this grand manner that we studied last week in the uh, 
Radiant Garden City Beautiful topic. This is the City Beautiful principles of visual corridors. Uh, long before the City Beautiful was a movement in the United States, it was a grand manner tradition of the Baroque. And before that, of Sixtus V in Rome, uh, we looked at the pilgrimage uh, transformation of Rome, etc. So these visual corridors are very much in fashion in city design at this point. Uh, and uh, the most appealing uh, reconfigurations on top of the ruins of the old uh, city of London are shown here where you see uh, an overlay of the footprints of buildings, including uh, the ground floor plan, almost like a Noli plan, uh, if you look closely at this image. Um, and the overlay, the proposal uh, to change the street pattern uh, through the construction of mainly housing, because uh, 80 to 90 percent of urban fabric is residential, and uh, the rest, only a tiny fraction, are things like churches, stores, government buildings, parks, etc. London, the history of London is also informed by the laws of enclosure, where uh, prior to private property, people, even otherwise very knowledgeable people, speak of private property as if it always existed. It's always been there, it always will be there, it's just natural. And so watch out when things are called natural. Ask yourself, are they natural or are they not natural? Prior to the 18th century, England operated primarily on a system of the commons. And uh, peasant farmers could farm the commons and keep uh, the, a portion, a, a vast majority of, their, uh, of what they grow if they give a portion of it to the feudal lord. This was a feudal system where there was, on a good day, there was a reciprocal relationship between the feudal lords and the peasant farmers. Um, uh, long story short, the laws of enclosure, which started uh, very early, um, uh, 12th in the 13th century, uh, but didn't really pick up until the 18th century, uh, where there was a more aggressive uh, effort to enclose the commons. And so the lands that were held as part of the commons, and yes, it is very much related to what we talked about, the tragedy of the commons, those parks that are at the center of most New England towns, uh, including the Boston Common, the Cambridge Common. Uh, there's probably a common quite near you. But these commons are the very small portion of lands that remain from what used to be the dominant land form of land rights, which is different from uh, single um, fee simple ownership uh, of private property is only one uh, form of land rights, of property rights. Uh, the much more common one was that you had the right to farm land and you had the right to the value produced by your labors to farm that land with the understanding there was an obligation of paying the equivalent of a tax to the feudal lord overseeing those commons. And uh, the laws of enclosure basically built fences, literally enclosed the commons and established and dis, uh, expropriated the commons out of uh, the commons land rights system and created monopoly ownership of private property in its place and the enclosure of walls, fences, and hedgerows across England that uh, pushed the, the farmers off of the land, the traditional lands, and into cities. And at the same time, uh, so these are the squares of London as the royal estates uh, urbanize uh, and uh, around uh, public parks that then became privatized uh, and you needed a key to get into through the gate. And we see that on uh, Beacon Hill today. It's, a, it's a, a direct inheritance from this uh, tradition 
uh, that came up through the transformation of London. London becomes a powerhouse of the world, exporting its, its coal around the world, and it uh, eventually powers steamships, the factory system. The Industrial Revolution that you studied in your prior schooling is very much a part of colonialism, which you might have studied as a separate thing. Colonialism, slavery, and the Industrial Revolution are three parts, three ingredients of uh, the larger category of extractive capitalism that rewards things like colonial empires. And these types of architectural urban formations to drive uh, these uh, commodity systems of mass production. Um, the laws of enclosure uh, displaces a large population of former agricultural workers. They are now available as factory labor, as long as they can occupy housing within walking distance of the factory. And so the factories are intensely localized where water power exists in uh, along the rivers of England and New England. And if you grew up in New England, um, this would be a great time to, for everyone to turn on their cameras um, and maybe say something in the Brightspace chat um, about where you grew up in New England and were you close to a factory, a water-powered factory town. <clears throat> Cameras, are you guys out there? Oh, thank you. So yes, I grew up near a factory town in New England, or no, I did not. Yes, yes, some of you, yes. I grew up near a factory town in England. I mean, in New England or England. Um, so they're all over England. They're all over New England. Uh, I'm in one. I'm in the city of Cambridge. Boston is one. Waltham. Every town around Boston, uh, almost every town uh, at its center had a water-powered mill or factory. Um, and here you see the physics, uh, uh, a gallon of water weighs eight pounds. And if you have uh, thousands of gallons of water dropping near your town, then you had the opportunity to construct a canal to keep uh, bring the, the water from a high point upstream, keep it high in a canal, bring it to a point where you're very nearby uh, the river that has dropped in elevation. And you can take that water for free uh, on a level canal over to your factory and then drop it in a pipe or run it against a water wheel. Uh, and eight pounds per gallon, uh, uh, every foot uh, that drops, that's eight pound feet. That's huge. If it drops 20 feet, you are going to be a very wealthy town. Congratulations. And so towns uh, grew up around the locations where uh, rivers dropped, uh, like Lawrence and Lowell and Manchester and Concord. Um, and so here, um, the, the decay and uh, filth of these factory towns, uh, the crowding because of the necessity of keeping your labor force close to your factories near the water system. Um, it created horrible conditions uh, where disease and death uh, followed, uh, went from town to town. And uh, prior to this year, we would always read Friedrich Engels' uh, portrayal of the factory town of Manchester when he was a little bit older than you are, his father said uh, to young Friedrich, I think it would be good for you to learn a trade. Why don't you come help me run my factory in Manchester? We'll make you an overseer. It was a plum job. 
Uh, he was being groomed for uh, becoming an elite factory owner, very wealthy family. Um, but he was horrified by the living conditions of the workers in the factory. And uh, this became one of the great themes of uh, the reformist movements of uh, the 19th century. What do we do about these horrible conditions that are sometimes portrayed in art, like Duray's, um, and sometimes in sociological mappings, like the Booth map of London, where uh, young Friedrich, at the age of 23, in 1844, observed that um, when he rides his cart, his, his carriage, through town, he comes through town along these streets with brightly lit shops selling wonderful wares uh, coming through here, the city of London. The red are the retail shops uh, that are quite nice and, and uh, grand, grandiose. But it's a thin layer of uh, shiny, bright retail. And just beyond that thin layer of retail, there is a darker reality on the inner blocks. Uh, where it's shown in dark blue. These are the horrific living conditions of the workers of the factories um, without proper sanitation, um, without proper health care, without uh, proper, you know, proper drainage. So there are puddles and uh, rats and it was not fun. And uh, so I think we, we looked at ideal factory towns um, that were the focus of reform in England. We did this last summer, so I'm going to quickly move on to the reforms uh, in the New World, uh, looking at New York. Here's a factory town uh, where we see the water dropping uh, over, the, over these, um, these uh, rapids and being captured high up in this canal and being allowed to drop in, in a more modern factory, they would drop it through pipes because you can capture uh, the energy more efficiently and powering all of these factories um, that are built along the canal. Same thing here in Lawrence. Um, these are leftover images analysis from the days when it was acceptable to do aerial views. Just so you know, that's no longer uh, what we're looking for. You will lose a point, at least a point. This one would lose two points. One, because there's no human scale in the foreground. And second, because we don't see enough of the larger relationship uh, of the fabric. It's too far away. But in the red, you'll notice these are, because of the patterns that we are sensitive to, we can actually see where the railroad lines used to run. They've been since pulled up. First factories were run by water power and water transportation. Later, steam power, often the coal was delivered by water, or uh, with the rise of steam power, steam locomotives then uh, delivered the coal. So uh, on top of the water and canal infrastructure, you see the development of rail infrastructure and you can see those patterns, even though in the next phase of cheap petroleum energy, we see uh, the substitution uh, from we the transition from steam power to uh, petroleum based energy, diesel, gasoline, electricity generated by diesel and gasoline. And so you see the replacement of the rail infrastructure with the freeway, the roads, trucks, cars, and now the worker housing is less relevant because increasingly with Fordism, remember Fordism, we have automobility and workers arriving by car or bus. But Jacob Rees, uh, this is an illustration that goes along with Friedrich Engels' uh, 1844 essay uh, on the conditions of the working class published in 1845. Uh, these inner alleys um, left very little uh, 
space for human occupation. And notice how primitive these drawings are. The reason these drawings are so uh, intolerably primitive is that architects were not interested in these things. These are the drawings of social scientists. Uh, we have joined this effort. We now bring uh, a higher level of architectural methods to the analysis and study of these uh, phenomena. Here you see Jacob Rees, uh, a brilliant photographer, documenting with flash photography um, uh, around 1900, the how the other half lives. This was his uh, photo essay on the slums of the Lower East Side of Manhattan, where I lived uh, when I went to architecture school. It, it was better than this when I lived there. But these are hot, you've heard about hot desking. That's what we do when we don't have enough studio space. Uh, you share a desk in studio. This is hot bedding. You, uh, you, you rent uh, a place to sleep by the hour. We'll look at this next week when we look at grid systems. Uh, the housing reform movements led to uh, the increasing of access to uh, light and air uh, as the regulations changed um, from what you see on the upper left and moving to the right. Um, things changed uh, from the upper left. They got worse uh, in the post 1850 a tenement design. And then in 1879, the new tenement laws uh, required uh, air shafts to bring uh, some light and some air uh, into every bedroom. Um, and the requirements got a little more stringent around 1900. Then in, I think, 1920, uh, you see up in Harlem, you see this housing type on the Upper West Side. And then increasingly, uh, in the early uh, decades of the 20th century, you see this ever more hygienic um, and generous housing design, um, design that is dictated by law to have this amount of light and air or better. All things we looked at, I believe, last summer. <clears throat> and here you see the transformation of the Lower East Side of Manhattan from these tenements that were established. Most of these follow the 1900 tenement law uh, configuration. Um, this is an analysis I, uh, I started producing when I was an undergraduate and then uh, was picked up by um, a student at Wentworth. Um, a better analysis would show the open space as white inside the purple, or maybe it would highlight it in orange, the air shafts and the alleys in the back. But um, what this does show is that the very dense housing pattern of the Lower East Side gets transformed over the course of the 20th century by the introduction of uh, public housing in the United States according to the principles of the Radiant City. So here you have the Radiant Garden City Beautiful principles in the slum clearance of my old neighborhood on the Lower East Side. What then must we do? I'm going to start with uh, some things that um, were originally intended to be part of uh, the optimistic ending to the lecture last Friday. Uh, but since we ran out of time there, I'm, I'm putting it in here. So think of these uh, practices uh, that have emerged uh, in the recent decades as being uh, reflective of what architects and urban designers have done in light of the insights of the materials that we looked at, the critical examination of history uh, that we looked at last week in the garden, the Radiant Garden City Beautiful Lecture. And so based on this criticism, um, a group of architects and urbanists uh, in the 1980s uh, got together and they noticed that when, when people in the United States go on vacation, 
Where do they go? They go to Rome, they go to Venice, they go to Amsterdam, they go to places, they go to Cinque Terre, they go to places where cars have not transformed uh, the urban or the landscape, the urban environment or the built environment. And so um, Duani and Plater Zyberg were hired by uh, a resort developer and they said uh, their charge was to design a resort that would be attractive to Americans. And so the step one was do a market study. Where do Americans like to go on vacation? And they realized very quickly, long story short, that the urban design and architectural design of the places that are attractive uh, for American tourists are illegal to build. It is literally impossible legally to build the type of fabrics, urban fabrics, that uh, are attractive to Americans when they go on vacation. Why? We studied those reasons why in the automobility lecture. Parking requirements, setbacks, uh, all especially parking requirements, that uh, these, these requirements by law uh, make it impossible uh, to produce uh, the types of places that we like to be in. So they uh, abandoned their modernist practice at uh, Architectonica in Miami, and they got together a bunch of friends, uh, and they uh, wrote the Charter for the Congress, the Charter of the Congress for the New Urbanism, which is an excellent document. Um, there is a lot to criticize about the Congress for the New Urbanism. Uh, we don't have time for that now, but suffice it to say, the Charter is a brilliant set of principles worthy of study and emulation. Uh, even if uh, some of the peripheral uh, dialogue that comes out of uh, this organization is of less value, they have a, a, a bad habit of taking credit for things um, that other people produced. So healthy uh, skepticism here is called for. Perhaps the most brilliant thing to come out of these uh, in endeavors is something called transit-oriented development. I'm sorry it doesn't say that on the slide. You will see it abbreviated as TOD, transit-oriented development. Did we invent it here in the United States? No, we didn't. It's basically called the common sense normal situation that we studied in the streetcar suburbs uh, that, that never was interrupted. It was interrupted in the United States, so we had to reinvent it in transit-oriented development. But in other parts of the world, like Japan, it was not interrupted. Uh, the Netherlands, it was interrupted, but they restored it back in the 70s. Uh, but basically, the idea is this, that when you have a high-capacity transit node, if you want to increase people's mobility at the lowest cost, you will allow higher density development around those high-capacity transportation nodes. And what do we mean by around? We mean, in the United States, we mean a quarter mile. Okay maybe a half mile. But uh, it's not crazy to allow much higher densities as measured by floor area ratio, FAR, around transit stations than you would normally allow. And by doing that, you can concentrate uh, activities and residential fabrics, high density residential high-density activity centers, mixed-use, mixed-income in all cases, around transit nodes. So I can leave my smallish apartment, walk to the transit node, take the high-speed whatever service to another node and where I can work. Where have we seen this that we might be familiar with? Well, not on the Wentworth campus, not yet. Wentworth is still uh, in denial about its the reality that it occupies a prime location in Boston. But just across Ruggles Street at Northeastern, 
uh, where they teach these things in their architecture program. Uh, the administration took their million dollar piece of property and turned it into a $10 million piece of property by uh, negotiating with the city of Boston a transit oriented development arrangement zoning and the city of Boston said, you know, your your floor area ratio, your FAR of 2.3 or 2.5, you, you, know, you know what, I think we should raise it. And Northeastern said, yeah, I think we should raise it. After fierce negotiation, the city of Boston settled for no limit. You can build as high as you want, uh, no limit. So that property around Ruggles Station owned by Northeastern got tremendously more valuable and the density went way up. They're able to house students uh, right there on campus. God forbid Wentworth wake up and look at what Northeastern did with transit-oriented development. Human scale, Jan Giel. So let me add to the complexity oh, of the situation we find ourselves in. Uh, at the same time that we're solving for climate change, we're going to be building cities for 3 billion people. That's a doubling of the urban environment. If we don't get that right, I'm not sure all the climate solutions in the world will save mankind. Because so much depends on how we shape our cities, not just environmental impacts, but our social well-being, our economic vitality, our sense of community and connectedness. Fundamentally, the way we shape cities is a manifestation of the kind of humanity we bring to bear. And so getting it right is, I think, the order of the day. And to a certain degree, getting it right can help us solve climate change because in the end, it's our behavior that seems to be driving the problem. Uh, the problem isn't free floating and it isn't just Exxon Mobil and oil companies, it's us, how we live how we live. There's a villain in this story, it's called sprawl, and I'll be upfront about that. But it's not just the kind of sprawl you think of, or many people think of, as low density development out at the periphery of the metropolitan area. Actually, I think that sprawl can happen anywhere at any density. The key attribute is that it isolates people. It segregates people into economic enclaves and land use enclaves. It separates them from nature. Uh, it doesn't allow the cross fertilization, the interaction that make cities great places and that make society thrive. And so the antidote to sprawl is really what we all need to be thinking about, especially when we're taking on this massive construction project. So let me take you through one exercise. We did this we built, developed the model for the state of California so they could get on with reducing carbon emissions. Uh, we did a whole series of, of scenarios for how the state could grow. And this is just one overly simplified one. We mixed different development prototypes and said they're going to carry us through the year 2050, 10 million new crew uh, in our state of California. And one was sprawl. It's just more of the same shopping malls, subdivisions, office parks. The other one was dominated by not everybody moving to the city, but just compact development. What we used to think of as streetcar suburbs, walkable neighborhoods, low rise, but integrated, mixed use environments. And the, and the results are astounding. They're astounding not just for the scale of the difference of this one shift in our city making habit, but also uh, because each one represents a special interest group. A special interest group that used to advocate for their concerns one at a time. They did not see the, what I call co-benefits of urban form and th that allows them to join with others. So land consumption, environmentalists are really concerned about this. So are farmers. Uh, and there's a whole range of people and, of course, neighborhood groups that want open space nearby. The sprawl version of California, it almost doubles the urban, the physical footprint. Greenhouse gas, tremendous savings because in California, our biggest 
carbon emission comes from cars. And cities that don't depend on cars as much obviously create huge savings. Vehicle miles traveled, that's what I was just talking about. Just reducing the average 10,000 miles per household per year from some, somewhere in the mid 26,000 per household has a huge impact, not just on air quality and carbon, but also on the household pocketbook. It's very expensive to drive that much. And as we've seen, the middle class is struggling to hold on. Health care. You know, we were talking about how do you fix it once we broke it, clean the air. Why not just stop polluting? Why not just use our feet and bikes more? And that's a function of the kinds of cities that we shape. Household costs. 2008 was a mark in time, not of just financial industry running amok. It was that we were trying to sell too many of the wrong kind of housing. Large lot, single family distant, too expensive for the average middle class family to afford, and quite frankly, not a good fit to their lifestyle anymore. But in order to move inventory, you can discount the financing and get it sold. I think that's a lot of what happened. Reducing costs by $10,000. Remember, California, the median is 50000 This is a big element. That's just cars and utility costs. So the affordable housing advocates, who often sit off in their silo, separate from the environmentalists, separate from the, uh, the, the politicians, everybody fighting with everyone, is now beginning to see common cause. And I think the common cause is what really brings about the change. Los Angeles, as a result of these efforts, has now decided to transform itself into a more transit-oriented environment. As a matter of fact, since 08, they voted in $400 billion of bonds for transit as opposed to, and zero dollars for new highways. What a transformation. LA becomes a, a city of walkers in transit, not a city of cars. How does it happen? You take the least desirable land, the strip, you add where there's space, transit, and then you infill uh, mixed use development. Uh, you satisfy new housing demands and you make the existing neighborhoods all around it more complex, more interesting, more walkable. Okay, here's another kind of sprawl. China, high density sprawl, what you think of as an oxymoron, but the same problems, everything isolated in super blocks. And of course, this amazing smog that was just spoken to. 12% of GDP in China now is spent on the health impacts of that. The history, of course, of Chinese cities is robust. It's like any other place. Community was all about small local shops and local services, and walking, interacting with your neighbors. May sound utopian, but it's not. It's actually what people really want. The new super blocks, these are blocks that would have 5,000 units in them. And they're dated as well because nobody knows anybody else. And of course, there isn't even a sidewalk no ground floor shops, a very sterile environment. Um, I found this one case here in uh, one of the super blocks where people had illicitly set up shops in their garages so that they could have that kind of local service economy. Uh, the, the desire of people to get it right is there. We just have to get the planners on board and the politicians. So I, I strongly recommend watching that, um, H. White is an urbanist one. and is the mentor of a project for public spaces because of his seminar work and the study of human behavior in urban settings. For nearly two decades, White has been observing how people use streets and public spaces. Although City is about the design and management of urban spaces, White's true fascination is with the life and rituals of people out on the streets. For him, the street is a stage. In his article about the social life of the street, Boy talks about the different aspects that are related to how people move around the city, specifically in New York, which is basically where he lives. Here he talks about street behavior, street conversations, and the like. In the first part of the article, Boy talks about street conversations. Here he shares an experiment that he did with his research team which required them to focus time-lapse cameras on several street corners and recorded activity for two weeks. 
On maps of the corners, they plotted the location of each conversation and how long it lasted. And to screen out people who were only waiting for the light to change, they noted only those conversations lasting a minute or longer. The results of the activity were not at all as expected. Even White didn't expect it, as it showed that people who stopped to talk did not move out of the pedestrian flow, and if they had been out of it, they'd moved into it. He observed that most of the conversations were smack in the middle of the pedestrian flow, which is also known as the 100% location. So the question now is, why do most people choose to engage in conversations in the middle of a crowded area? Well, according to observers in other countries, they have noted that we had the tendency to self-congest ourselves. Self-congestion. According to Matthew Kulek, who said he has a weird fetish for shopping centers, the great majority of people were found to select their sites for social interaction right on or very close to the traffic lines intersecting the plaza. Relatively few people formed their gatherings away from the spaces. So, um, so the, uh, the point here, uh, first, Peter Calthorpe's uh, TED Talk, which I strongly recommend you look at, has uh, morphed and changed into a proposal for the San Francisco Bay Area, especially the peninsula between San Jose and San Francisco where he has proposed this type of complete street arrangement, where it is now more or less a continuous uh, sprawl, shopping mall, parking lot landscape. And by uh, concentrating uh, high uh, capacity mass transportation along this corridor, there is a, a, a single street that connects San Jose with uh, with San Francisco and a string of towns along the way. Uh, by putting high capacity public transportation along that corridor and in the parking lots constructing <clears throat> street walls uh, like the one in this slide, you, you start to uh, address the severe problems of uh, the Bay Area all in one blow. You uh, reduce the traffic congestion. You increase the housing supply uh, to address one of the most expensive places to live and work in the world. And you create a, vi a more vibrant urban setting that is appropriate to the Silicon Valley and related economic activities and workforce. Um, so this is, this is something that is... Uh, really, again, all about the proper management of land and labor, specifically housing and mobility. So land and labor in the capitalist equation, uh, we translate here in the world of design, architecture and urban design, as housing, mobility, and the land use transportation patterns. What is the connection between transportation patterns and land use patterns. And in this, we identify that the problems of the 20th century uh, that we've inherited are that transportation was considered in isolation. Land use was considered uh, through the mechanisms of single use zoning. And uh, it's only through mixing, mixing uses and mixing incomes that we can actually produce the healthier holistic vision of how cities work. Jan Heel. a reality. And it looks a lot like the visions of science fiction films. Giga cities are soon to be. In the midst of this cold, bleak vision of the future, we have the human being. It is personal, warm, social, Nobody knew that the way we built cities had any influence on lifestyles and people's life. I think we made a lot of the same mistakes 
as the uh, Western countries has made. We're living in a world that's choked with traffic everywhere, where we've made our own human living environment deadly for people. You actually walking towards a chaos created by yourself. City planning has been going on for quite a number of years with a rather incomplete toolbox. To refocus all of those engineers and planners, you needed new quantitative tools. And that's what Mian helped us do. Get the baseline data, set some targets, now let's plan our street to meet them. It's giving people just a little bit of a taste of like what their lives could be like if the space were designed for them. What? Times Square has no square. 89% uh, of it isn't even a square. We needed to change the math. Melbourne was in fact dying. So just to finish off, um, I want to show you a few things um, that Samuel Mockby in the Rural Studio uh, became very famous for these very innovative designs for a handful of very poor people in Alabama. Since his death, uh, others who have taken on the leadership of the, outdoor, of the Rural Studio have shifted focus on something that can scale up and actually produce a huge number of houses at very low cost to change the affordability issue. Closer to home, there's a recent uh, movement in architecture and urban design and political circles uh, that has identified the missing middle uh, segment of housing. We have high-rise multifamily dwellings and we have detached single family homes. But what we're missing are all of these housing architectural typologies of the middle where uh, affordability could actually uh, match the, 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 the need. There is a mismatch between supply and demand in housing. And a lot of people are addressing that. Uh, one of the movements uh, that I sent an article on the WhatsApp chat is about the, uh, the movement of city after city to outlaw single family zoning. And in its place, they, uh, they uh, now encourage accessory dwelling units where what was the garage for the two cars is now an apartment for the in-laws, it's the, another way it's talked about is the in-law unit. And so this missing middle is very much a part of a larger form-based zoning code approach that instead of dictating, instead of using zoning to have single use areas, you use zoning to require mixed uses, mixed income, and you use forms uh, as the basis of the code, you require certain street wall dimensional, certain mixing of uses, and certain formal characteristics. And this is part of a smart growth strategy that has been embraced uh, uh, in the state of Massachusetts in the form of the Chapter 40R regulations that uh, are summarized in this slide. And for those of you who are uh, participating next fall in the Mattapan uh, Milton studio, uh, we will be looking at 40R, 40S regulations as they manifest moving forward in uh, the towns of uh, around Boston. So that's the lecture. Thank you, everyone. Um, if you have questions, uh, please stay after class. Otherwise, see you on Wednesday. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.